Hello, this is uh, my lecture on um, Elizabethan Jacobean tragedies. Um, remember Shakespeare's writing both in the Elizabethan and Jacobean times as his plays come under the Elizabeth's period and also James's period who comes straight afterwards. Then we have later Jacobean tragedies. Okay, the uh, the areas I'm going to talk about are really the rules of tragedy because I think if you know the 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 conventions or the rules of uh, tragedy and you know the way that these plays are structured and they seem to be structured in a uniform way then that can really help you to understand uh, what the playwright's trying to say in his play or her play um, and so when you may get stuck with the language and you you feel that you're uncomfortable just understanding or com comprehending what they're saying uh, if you know the rules and the structure of the play, this can help you to sort of work through that. Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, the conventions of rules of tragedy, how they're structured, and how they follow a st similar structural pattern um, in all of Shakespeare's plays and uh, plays of this period. I'll be looking at aspects of a tragic hero and looking at how the plays kind of have a circular, cyclical structure of going from order to disorder and then coming back to a sort of restoration of order or new order at the end. Okay, let's move on. The first thing we've got to remember about drama is that you can't have any drama without conflict. Okay, you must have conflict. Now Shakespeare's writing in a world in which um, there are two world, uh, two world orders or two uh, views of the world coexisting at the same time and these are conflicting views of the world and they can be represented by these two pictures really. The first one on your left is uh, a representation in art of the medieval period and the one on the right is a representation of art in the um, renaissance period. Um, if we take the left one it's uh, what's typical of uh, the medieval period is that all art is in praise of God and the medieval period uh, this main belief is that there is a, a natural order of being with God at the top and everyone in a fixed place in society um, if you look at the images of the people in the painting they're all kind of flat there's a kind of lack of perspective uh, that's probably because they didn't believe that humans as individuals were that important it was that it was a god-centered world and that um, it, this is a celebration of God and that humanity is kind of uh, below below God in that sense uh, as you notice in the painting everyone seems to have a fixed place uh, a fixed pattern and it was natural that everyone followed their fixed place in society and didn't uh, deviate from that. What we have on the right in the Renaissance view of the world uh, as represented by uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Vitruvian Man is uh, this is like a study of the individual. This is uh, da Vinci trying to capture how humans really look and in a way that's Shakespeare's intentions in, uh, in the Elizabethan period to capture how individuals look rather than uh, just based on types as would be the case in medieval drama so uh, with da Vinci trying to capture uh, the flaws and perfection of man that's similar to what Shakespeare's trying to do in his plays um, these two world views have are in conflict more modern people as represented by uh, uh, the Renaissance painting on the right uh, are less willing to accept their place in society uh, so we have the Shakespearean villains have a much more modern world view they're, they're not superstitious or they don't believe in uh, the old way of looking at things so this is the conflict that seems to be at the heart of Shakespeare's plays the idea that there are characters believing in the old world view of the medieval order and characters who are much more modern in their outlook and this brings the uh, the conflict into uh, into place right this uh, image that you see before you now is a image of Machiavel, Machiavelli um, so he's, he's come to be synonymous with the term uh, a Machiavellian character this is usually someone who is uh, 
probably representing the the modern world order, the Renaissance view of the world. They are they are out for self gain. Okay, usually a Machiavellian character is going to be one of the Shakespearean villains. They're out to make their own way in the world, probably because they don't fit into the old world order. They don't fit into the medieval world order. So we have characters like Edmund in King Lear, who's a bastard son. He uh, he's not going to inherit anything. He has no uh, he sees no value in the fixed world order because he's outside it, rather like this green figure here. And so he's going to find his own place in the world. And they usually work by devious methods. Uh, Machiavellian means manipulative or devious in today's society. Uh, Iago is a classic example. My medicine works, thus credulous fools are caught. It's, uh, they're going to make their own way in the world by, uh, by manipulating the superstitious beliefs of others and the trust of others. Right, um... I'm just going to go through quickly the rules of tragedy, the conventions of uh, tragedy. Now, the important thing is, tragedy, you go to the theatre, you know how it's going to end. This is a very p predictable form of theatre. So it's not so much about uh, the surprise ending, because we know it's going to end in tragedy. It's going to end in death. The death of the innocents, the death of the tragic hero, the death of those deserving death, the villains. Okay, um, And... The audience know how it's going to end, and so we have constant predictive elements throughout the play that reinforce how this play is going to end. So we have soliloquies, asides or stage whispers by the characters telling us what they're going to do. We as an audience have a uh, much more uh, knowledge of what's happening on stage than the, than the characters. So we know that Iago is going to play um, Othello, uh, he's going to trick him, so there's always a traumatic irony uh, at work in this play. Now the imagery uh, and the symbolism in the play sort of foreshadow the ending. They kind of hint at what's going to happen later on in the play. Um, tragedy is also uh, a mixture of verse and prose. The subplot is, which I will talk about later, is usually in prose or everyday language, which is what I'm trying to speak now. And verse is much more the heightened epic language of soliloquy uh, that we see from the major characters, the protagonist. This uh, this um, um, plan here is something I learned from a professor at university where we had to study lots of Shakespeare plays. And he said that, well, they all follow a similar structure, as do the comedies as well. They follow a similar pattern. And if we can see that there's uh, five different acts, uh, same sort of things happen in each act. So the first act will start with some kind of disorder or complication. So there's a, a disruption in the natural order of being, a conflict. Right? This, so um, Othello marries Desdemona. Desdemona's family are unhappy about it. Her father is unhappy about it. There's war. So we usually find in Act 1 the introduction of a disorder, a conflict. Now Act 2... Uh, develops the rivalry or the two sides of uh, this conflict. Um, so we have uh, Iago's jealousy coming out um, and his intentions to kind of uh, trick and uh, betray Othello. Uh, and we see that in all the other plays, the development of rivalry and disorder. The conflict can also be within a c the main character. Um, maybe the, uh, you know, the... Co uh, protagonists are in conflict with each, with, within themselves and so this inner conflict can be developed in Act 2 also. Now Act 3 is usually really important because we have a climax here, a, uh, some kind of action that hints at a point of no return. Um, so in Romeo and Juliet, Mercutio is killed and that leads to the final tragedy at the end. Um, Gloucester's eyes are gouged out in Lear. Um, the handkerchief leads to Othello t declaring that he's going to kill his wife. And this all happens in Act 3. It's the point of no return and it leads to the final tragedy. Act 4s, you tend to find they just kind of uh, set up action for the final act. Uh, so there's often not a lot actually uh, uh, really happens in Act 4s. It's setting up for the final finale. And then in Act 5 we have the final climax. Uh, the protagonist gains a kind of understanding of their errors. They begin to see the world in a new way, or they see themselves in a new way, but it comes too late. So we have uh, the final tragedy, but afterwards 
we have a kind of restoration of order or a resolution or an, a new order, a new way of looking at things. Usually with the absence of the protagonist, they're dead. Okay, And that sums up all of Shakespeare's tragedies. It sums up in many ways also the comedies, except in Act 5 the threat of tragedy is averted and that uh, we get a happy ending. But we tend to find the same kind of pattern in Shakespeare's um, comedies as well as his tragedies. Okay, just so a quick word on imagery. Um, Shakespeare and Elizabethan uh, plays often have a kind of grouped imagery that runs through the play. And you can may, may be a, able to identify the play from the imagery that, that seems to run through it. Poison, for instance, is, is often imagery used in um, tragedies because it's symbolic of corruption, of the natural order being corrupted. So Iago talks about pouring poison into the ear of Othello. Um, in Hamlet, the court of Denmark is, uh, is said to be poisoned or corrupted. Uh, blood is the imagery that runs through Macbeth and represents the sense of guilt uh, that uh, Macbeth uh, uh, has. Uh, madness and insanity are uh, common uh, imagery that we see running through the plays. Uh, the imagery of sleep again is something in Macbeth. There's an absence of sleep, so again suggesting the sort of guilt that that applies. So try to see where there's uniform patterns in your in your play. There's, is there constant references to a certain sort of um, imagery, and how might that fit in with the meanings that your playwright is dealing with? I'm going to say a quick word about soliloquies because they often give students real um, real difficulty because of the language. But one way around that is to think about what, what is it that soliloquies actually do. They do four things, in my opinion. And if you know what those four things are, you're more likely to understand what the soliloquy is trying to say. Now remember, this is the protagonist on stage alone. They are sharing their inner thoughts with the audience. They are therefore truthful. Um, now, I think they do four things, soliloquies. First of all, I think they show hesitation, indecision, conflict. Inner conflict is about not knowing actually what you're going to do or what you are. So uh, Hamlet here is saying, what shall I do to, um, to be or not to be? Am I going to kill myself or just carry on living? The, so there's, there's conflict about what to do. Sometimes they might be revealing to the audience their plan. Right, these are my intentions. This is what I'm going to do. I must kill the king. Uh, so we are privy to their inner thoughts and ideas. This is something that uh, the villains do also, and that allows us to understand what the villain's motivation is. Um, at the end of the play, usually around Act 5, sometimes in Act 3 also, after they've committed some kind of the major climax that leads to the end, they begin to question themselves and they be begin to question the world. So sometimes they're going to have, if it's Act 5, an understanding of how the world really is. Uh, they've gained a new vision of what the world is like, or they've gained a new aspect of self-knowledge. They've realized where they've gone wrong in themselves. So part of the, the weakness of a, a tragic hero is that they lack self-knowledge. Well, part of the tragedy is that they gain it, um, but it comes too late. And that's usually reflected in a soliloquy. And um, I think that sums up what soliloquies do in Shakespeare and in Marlowe. And in, and in later Jacobean plays also. Right, quick word about subplots, uh, as represented by the image on the left. They mirror uh, the main plot. Okay, they amplify um, or, or uh, the themes of the main plot, and they kind of um, they show the world in which the play is taking place, which again reflects on the values and ideas in the main plot, and. Um, they make us look at the themes from a new perspective. The falling man on the right is sometimes you, you, you sometimes find that characters, the main characters, uh, uh, have parallel actions going on in the subplot that makes us think about their main uh, mistakes or their actions. So we see minor characters like servants doing similar things to the to the main character in the play, and that makes us uh, look at the main character's actions in a new way. Occasionally, the main characters might fall into their own subplot.
they are diminished by their by their actions and so they become part of the 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 minor world of the subplot characters perhaps showing us that they've lost their sense of dignity or something this is what happens in in Faustus for instance he, he becomes part of his own subplot and so he's reduced in stature um, as, as a result characters in subplots speak in prose or everyday language um, because they're not the heroic central characters um, who speak in verse it's important to be able to see the distinction when you're looking at your text between verse and prose. Okay, um, this section I'm talking about is that all of these plays seem to deal with opposites and parallels. Shakespeare is quite, uh, quite keen on showing um, sort of binary opposites in his plays. Now, what I mean by that, and this is to do with the uh, uh, the imagery that runs through his um, Shakespearean tragedies, is that we often find deliberate opposites. So, for instance, in King Lear, we've got the idea of um, uh, a blind man. Um, uh, Gloucester's eyes are gouged out, he becomes blind. But only in his blindness does he have the ability to see, to understand the world as it really is. So when he had his sight, he was blind, but when he was blind, he managed to actually see things as they really were. Again, the same goes for this image of madness or insanity. It's uh, often the case in Shakespeare's plays that the mad or the fool um, uh, speak the most wisdom. Only in madness do people gain real wisdom. Uh, so this is something to look out for also in terms of the imagery in the play, where you get these kind of binary opposites of um, you know, madness revealing uh, wisdom. And I suppose one way of remembering that is just to think about the, um, the typical the typical image of uh, theatre, uh, you know, the typical icon of uh, the, uh, the two masks, the smiling and the, the sad mask, is that, you know, theatre is often about um, opposites and, and, and things that are parallels. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, the representation of women in, um, in tragedies. I think summed up by these four here, obviously uh, Angelina, the sort of temptress, the strong, uh, sexual predator um, who, who tempts a man again a kind of modern um, Eve figure who uh, uh, who contributes to the downfall of the uh, the main protagonist in some way uh, the Cruella de Vil figure the the woman who uh, perhaps is as aggressive and as violent as as a man and she's out to get her own uh, to get her own ends uh, and will use violence and as much aggression as a man. And then we have the, the other side of the coin, um, Vanessa, perhaps the, the pure and innocent uh, girl who is perhaps uh, the victim of the sins of others, a little bit like Ophelia, the innocent, the, inno the pure and innocent um, Cordelia in, in uh, King Lear. The, the kind of perfect um, visions of femininity, um, but in tragedies they're often damaged and uh, and en end up killed. Cheryl probably represents the um, yeah the victim again the kind of the innocent the innocent victim um, who uh, part of the tragedy is uh, is killed as a result of the actions of others, and I suppose I'm thinking again of Ophelia Desdemona. Um, and Cordelia. Now, if you took a feminist stance on this, if you took a feminist reading of these, uh, uh, of the portrayal of women in Elizabethan Jacobean theatre, you could say contradictory things. You could say, first of all, this era shows very strong women, like Angelina. Uh, uh, these are sexual uh, women who are out to get their to get their own needs met. Um, they're not submissive. They're strong and they work outside the rules of their society. So in fact, literature of this period is showing strong, dynamic women who are, who are not willing to be bowed down to the, uh, the values of their time. A contradictory way of looking at uh, uh, of this, uh, from a feminist point of view, might be to say that, um, again, we're shown sort of uh, unrealistic images of uh, uh, beauty and innocence and uh, uh, and women who are passive and who just allow 
uh, fate to uh, le you know to kill them really, and they don't do anything to stop it. Um, also, there's the idea that there's a kind of uh, inherent criticism of women. Uh, all of these strong women, the uh, Cruella de Vil and Angelina figures, they all end up dead in the play. It's almost as if um, their s their sexual appetite or their uh, appetite for violence must be punished with death by the end of the play. And that ultimately m women are, are, um, are killed as a result and they're kept in their place. At the end, the message is that in the end they are uh they 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 meet their ends they meet their downfall okay um the end of the play usually comes with order restored the protagonist is killed uh the disruption that begins the play is um is uh is is finished and a resolution is brought to order now this might mean, as in King Lear, a new world order is about to be created or that the old world order is completely destroyed. But there's a sense of um, uh, those who are left uh, resolving to restore order and that's how the play ends. And that allows the audience to kind of expel all their emotions <coughs> and uh, have a sense of catharsis, a sense of release. Um, and that leaves me to finish on sort of words that kind of have cropped up in the study of plays and uh, and tragedies along the way. And um, the final the final screen shows images that uh, a, a good A level student should be comfortable being able to use um, in in terms of their their writing on any kind of tragedy. And um, there endeth the lecture. Uh, I hope you found this useful. Okay, thank you.